Welcome to the 2018 Silliman Memorial Lecture. My name is Jay Humphrey and I am a, a faculty member here in biomedical engineering. And it's really my pleasure and honor to introduce our colleague from Rice University Department of Biomedical, uh, Bioengineering. Before I invite her uh, to the podium, however, I'd like to call your attention uh, to the brief description of this lecture that can be found in the back of your program. Established near the turn of the 20th century, this lecture honors Mrs. Hepsa Silliman, daughter of a 1769 Yale graduate and mother of an 1824 Yale graduate. Today we continue this legacy of remembrance. The first Silliman lecture was delivered in 1901 by J.J. Thompson, discoverer of the electron. In addition to his many contributions to science, he was also well known as a gifted teacher and mentor. Indeed, many who worked with him also went on to earn Nobel Prizes. As one reviews the history of this venerable lecture, many other names from physics, chemistry, mathematics, medicine, medicine and beyond can be found. As for example, Rutherford, Nernst, Arrhenius, Osler, Hadamard, Bohr, Hubble, Leakey, and others. Today we're honored to continue, continue this tradition for which we have um, a legacy of, of over a century. And with us today is someone who is similarly committed to discovery as well as engineering, science, and design, and the translation of new knowledge to improve the human condition. She is also, as was the inaugural Silliman Lecturer, a committed teacher and mentor, truly an outstanding role model in every regard. Rebecca Richards Cordham is the Malcolm Gillis University Professor of Bioengineering, Electrical and Computer Engineering at Rice University, and Director of the Rice 360 Institute for Global Health, and founder of Beyond Tr Traditional Borders. She has contributed fundamental and translational findings in biomedical optics and global health, among other areas. Her work has been published in over 315 archival journal articles, and she is author of a book published by Cambridge University Press, Biomedical Engineering for Global Health. These works have been cited nearly 28,000 times. I refer you to the center portion of the program for more information. But briefly, Professor Richards Cordham has received many well-deserved honors, including being named Howard Hughes Medical Institute Professor, a MacArthur Fellow. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering and also the National Academy of Science. She is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society, among others. Most importantly, however, Professor Richards Cordham cares deeply about people, and she has dedicated her professional life to creating new technologies to provide improved health care to vulnerable populations, especially those in remote or low-resourced settings. Since this lecture is being taped, I now ask that you would kindly silence your cell phone or other electronic devices as you join me in welcoming Professor Rebecca Richards Cordham. to be here today and to have the opportunity to share our work with you. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. It's been a really exciting and inspiring day. And um, I, I am really uh, looking forward to talking with you about my favorite thing in the world, which is babies. And uh, I'm going to talk about the work that our team has done to try and uh, end preventable newborn death in sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm going to start by just trying to put this problem in context for you. And um, I want to start with the global target that we have for newborn survival. So um, with the Millennium Development Goals, we had targets for child survival, but we did not have a target for newborn survival. And we made a lot of progress to reduce rates of mortality for children 
but we made comparatively little progress to reduce rates of newborn mortality. And as a result, newborn deaths now account for 45% of all childhood deaths. But in the SDGs, we have a target for newborn survival. So all countries should get uh, newborn death rates below 12 per thousand by 2030. So uh, let's take a look at what it will take to actually achieve that target. So what's shown on the y-axis is mortality rate. The green is the childhood mortality rate. The blue is the newborn mortality rate. And we have data, and then we have projections. And so if we look at newborns, you can see that there's been less progress for newborns. Here's our target right here. If we are going to hit our target, we have to double the rates of progress that we're making toward this goal. And the biggest gap for um, the places where acceleration is most needed are African countries. More than 30 African countries need to double the rates of progress that they're making if they're going to achieve the SDG. So we can look at that projection. So again, now we're looking at newborn mortality versus time. So here's this year. And if we look at where we'll be at current rates of progress to get to the SDG, where we're supposed to be in 2030, if we don't accelerate our progress, it won't be, we won't be there for Africa until 2066. And if we ask the question, when will a baby born in Africa have the same chance of survival as a baby born in a high-income country? The answer is not until 2124. It will be more than 110 years before we achieve equity for newborn survival. And I think the most there's so many things that are sad about that statistic, but for me, the thing that is most troubling is when we think about the progress that we made in this country to improve newborn survival, it really started in the late 1960s, early 1970s, when we introduced regional NICUs. It will take African countries three times as long to make that progress as it did for us to make that progress in the United States. We have a Tesla in space, and it will take three times as long for African countries to make that same kind of progress. And I think that's just not acceptable, given all of the technologies that we have available to us. So let's take a look at, historically, what happened in the US and the UK. So again, we're looking at newborn mortality, and we're looking at actual data in the US and the UK. So here's where we were in the 1900s. Our newborn mortality was 40 per thousand. That's where most of Western and Central Africa is today. So if we look at the first phase of reduction, there was a 25% reduction from 40 to 30 um, over that 40-year period from 1900 to 1940. And that was primarily public health improvements, so sanitation, improvements in clean water. That allows you to go from 40 to 30. That's where most of Eastern Africa is today, where we were in the 40s. If we want to go the next step of the way to where we were in the 1970s, this is where South Africa is today, that happened by providing basic care, so warmth, improved feeding, improved hydration. If we want to get below 15 and reach the target of 12, we cannot get there without technology. Data from every middle income and upper income country that made that transition to get below the SDG target did it by making technology available for comprehensive newborn care. And so what we really need is we really need to have basic care and comprehensive newborn care. And so what I would like to talk with you about is the approach that we have been taking to think about how, as an engineering community, can we think about the need to develop technologies that can allow countries that are 
at the newborn mortality rates of 40 and 30, how can we make it possible for them to achieve the SDG? And I think that's possible now more than ever before because of three important shifts that have happened over the last 15 years. The first important shift is that there has been a big investment to understand how many newborns are dying, where are they dying, and why are they dying. And this was largely in part um, led by investments from the Gates Foundation. And so we really have a very good understanding to track where progress is needed. But evidence without political will does not lead to change. <coughs> now that we have a target for newborn survival, we have political will. And this is something that's new in the last few years. But finally, the third, and I think in some ways most exciting shift, is that the place of birth is moving. And it's moving from home into healthcare facilities. 80% of women are now delivering in healthcare facilities worldwide. And so change is possible as never before. But change is not inevitable. There was a really interesting article that was published in the Journal of Global Health in December of 2017. And what they did in this paper was they surveyed health facilities in five countries. And they just looked at whether or not they had the facilities to deliver newborn care or maternal care, and whether they had a clinical workforce that was ready to deliver maternal care and newborn care. And across all five countries, the thing that scored the most poorly was facility readiness for newborn care. And this is a quote from the conclusion of that article that says, in all five countries, key services for newborns were missing from a large proportion of facilities that offer delivery services. And the big risk is that not just that we'll provide poor quality care, but if women come to facilities to have their babies and they're met by poor quality care and their babies die, we run the very big risk that they will stop coming to facilities to have their babies. And that will have a shift in the progress that we've made to get more women coming to facilities. So I have um, had the pleasure to be part of a, a multi-institutional and multi multidisciplinary team called NEST that is focused on trying to address this challenge. So NEST stands for Newborn Essential Solutions and Technologies, and it's a partnership between Rice University, Northwestern University, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the University of Malawi, and five other universities in Malawi, Tanzania, and Nigeria. And we are focused on trying to provide the technologies that are needed for newborn care in this setting. This is Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital, the main teaching hospital in Malawi. And when you walk through Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital, you see a lot of equipment that was designed for high resource settings that was donated to the facility that ends up in what we refer to as the equipment graveyard. So here you can see some oxygen concentrators. Before we were looking at a big pile of syringe pumps. This equipment was donated by people who really wanted to do something positive, but when the equipment encounters the harsh environmental conditions, the heat, the dust, the humidity, the line voltage surges and sags, it fails and it's really not able to provide care. And what is needed instead is a set of equipment that is effective, that is affordable, and that is sustainable. And that is the kind of equipment that we, our team, and a whole community of innovators has been focused on trying to develop over the last five to 10 years. And so when I first went to Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital, I was um, taken to the, the newborn intensive care unit, and I saw babies like this one. This is a little baby. His name is Chicken Jetso. He was born prematurely. <laughs> He um, suffered from respiratory distress syndrome, as about half of babies who are born prematurely do. In the US or another high resource setting, this would easily be treated 
with a technology called CPAP, which stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. And it's basically a way to provide a blended mix of air and oxygen at constant pressure to reduce the work of breathing while the baby um, begins producing a surfactant that reduces alveolar surface tension and then um, is able to uh, breathe with less work of breathing. So my, my clinical collaborators explained to me that CPAP machines cost about $6,000. Most of them require wall air and wall oxygen, which were not available at this particular facility. And they were really frustrated that they did not have access to this technology. So my colleagues and I went back to Rice University. We have a maker space, very similar to the one that I got to visit here today. And we began working with our students to think about developing a low cost bubble CPAP system. So you just saw Queen Dubay there, the pediatrician that we collaborate with. And this is the very first prototype CPAP system that they developed. There are two aquarium pumps that are inside this little plastic shoebox, some flow regulators to blend the flow, and a bottle of water to control the uh, end expiratory pressure. And the students were able to take this device over to Texas Children's Hospital and compare the flow and pressure that their device delivered, and they were able to show that it matched the performance of the systems that were being used at Texas Children's Hospital. And so one of the students on the team, Jocelyn Brown, who you see here, traveled to Malawi as part of a summer internship. And she demonstrated her CPAP device to all of the nurses that worked in the newborn unit. And they told her everything that was wrong with her device. They said, this little plastic shoebox, it's too flimsy, it's going to break. They said some of the tubes come out the front, other tubes come out the back. It's too easy to put the wrong tube in the wrong port. You've designed it to run on a 110 volt source. That's not the line voltage that we have here in Malawi. But they wanted to keep it and begin using it to treat their patients. And so Jocelyn took her device, she brought it back to Rice, and we worked with a commercial partner to make the device more rugged, more robust, to go through a quality manufacturing process, and then to secure permission from our IRB and the local IRB to evaluate its performance. And this is what that little shoebox turned into. Um, we call this device the Pumani. Kuwani means breathe restfully in Chichewa, the local language. And it was chosen by the nurses who gave Jocelyn the feedback on that first device. So with IRB permission, we were able to evaluate the performance of this technology. And we compared rates of survival for babies who suffered from respiratory distress syndrome who were treated with nasal oxygen at the time, the local standard of care two babies who were treated with CPAP. And we found that survival improved from 24% to 65% when they were treated with the CPAP device. We've since partnered with a company called Third Stone Design, who took the technology through the regulatory approval process, and we got funding from USAID to begin scaling it up across Malawi. And so we partnered with the Ministry of Health to deliver CPAP to all 28 district hospitals in the country um, that are uh, run by the government, as well as the majority of the mission district hospitals. And we've worked now with 14 nursing and clinical officer schools to implement training for CPAP as part of the pre-service training curriculum. When we first started this project, I thought that when we got to um, the end of the scaling, we would be done. That that would be the end of, of this uh, project. And um, I, we were all wrong in, in that assumption. Because as we traveled around to these district hospitals, what we found was that babies were cold and there was no uh, uh, technology to provide warmth. Babies were dehydrated. There weren't syringe pumps to deliver fluid. Babies had jaundice. They didn't have phototherapy lights and ways to diagnose jaundice. And clinicians were really, really frustrated that they didn't have the tools that were needed to help provide comprehensive care for their patients. 
We came back from that experience feeling that if we continued to introduce technologies one at a time, what we would find is that outcomes would continue to be capped low. What we found in our rollout of CPAP was that babies who were hypothermic did not do very well if you only provided CPAP. It's not surprising. It's not the approach that any other um, middle, or low in, uh, middle or high income country took in scaling up care for newborns. And so we came back to the drawing board and we said, let's look at this problem holistically and let's start with what are the leading causes of mortality for babies in this setting. And all across the world, babies die of three main causes of death. They're born prematurely, they suffer from an infection, or they're injured during labor and delivery. And from these causes of death, we looked at what are the pathways of care that clinicians need to provide to prevent or treat these causes of death. And we identified seven different pathways of care that they needed to provide. So the baby in the middle is getting CPAP, but we also need to be able to monitor and treat jaundice if he suffers from that. We need to do that in a separate neonatal ward where their uh, babies aren't getting exposed to infections that are coming in from the pediatric population. They need to be kept warm. They need to, um, we need to diagnose, prevent, and treat infections. And so we thought about, with all these pathways of care, what technologies are needed to enable clinicians to provide those pathways of care. And what surprised me was that the list is not that long. It's a list of 17 different technologies that if you had access to these 17 things, you had the ability to provide care along these pathways. And we looked at what is available commercially that meets our criteria of effectiveness, affordability, and sustainability. And what we found was that for about half of these technologies, for eight, there are commercially available alternatives that have been designed specifically to work in, in uh, low resource settings. But for nine, there were no commercially available alternatives. And so our team began to try and develop technologies to address these needs. So for example, um, if you look at the problem of jaundice, there are a lot of phototherapy lights that are out there on the market that have been designed to work in low resource settings. MTTS makes the Firefly, DREV makes Brilliance. So there's not a need, Little Sparrows makes um, the Billy Hut. There's not a need, we thought, for another uh, appropriate set of phototherapy lights. But there was no commercially available bilirubin mon serum bilirubin monitor that we could identify. And so that's a problem that we took on and began developing. Um, and so we've been working for a number of years to bring that together. And what we did this last year was we put together the whole set of 17 technologies. And it was really exciting to see what they all look like together. So this is um, what we think a district hospital that has uh, 5,000 deliveries per year should be equipped with. So you can see the phototherapy lights, um, delivering phototherapy. Here's an oxygen concentrator and a flow splitter. Um, here you see um, the CPAP set up with the concentrator, a syringe pump, a suction machine, a pulse oximeter. Um, so in, in sizing this for a hospital that has 5,000 deliveries per year, we think that this equipment should have a lifetime of five years and that it's really important to minimize the cost of consumables. And if you just work out the math for how much it costs to provide this package of technology divided by the number of deliveries that um, would be delivered at a hospital over that five-year period, we estimate that this set of technologies could be delivered for $1.48 per delivery. And so I think the exciting thing is that technology has the potential to be as affordable as vaccines, which we have been very effective at scaling up. Um, and, and this includes, rolled into this, is the cost of distribution as well as the cost of supplying consumables over that five-year period. So 
um, our, our team is, is working to complete this package of innovations. We are constantly surveying the landscape of what is commercially available and as new things become commercially available, adding them into the package where they make sense, comparing their performance in the field to look at whether they're sufficiently rugged and, um, and robust. But we also need to think about the challenge of distribution. So the phototherapy lights that I mentioned earlier, the MTTS lights, are distributed primarily in Vietnam. The DREV phototherapy lights are distributed primarily in India. And if you try and order either set of lights in Africa, you're going to pay more in shipping than you will um, to pay for the cost of the lights. So the challenge of distribution in Africa is really significant for medical technologies. We also simultaneously need to think about how do we aggregate demand in the public sector and the private sector, because it's very difficult to solve the distribution challenge if you haven't aggregated demand. And one of the things that it will take to aggregate demand and unlock demand, unlock resources in the public sector especially, is good quality evidence that this package of technologies can save lives and that it can do so in a way that is cost effective. We need to really demonstrate that we can achieve that $1.48 number, not just estimate that we can achieve that number. And so um, I want to walk you through briefly each of those elements of, of what our team is doing together. So let me start with where we are in terms of innovation. This is a picture that was taken at Lagos University Teaching Hospital, so it's one of the largest teaching hospitals in Nigeria. And you can see that they are very well equipped with phototherapy lights. So those are the, the DREV lights that you see being used at Luth. But they don't have a way to measure bilirubin concentration. And so our team came back and um, began developing a point of care tool to measure bilirubin. And it consists of um, a little piece of uh, paper and plastic there is a membrane here that you apply a drop of uh, blood from a heel stick to, and then you um, remove a piece of paper that exposes adhesive, fold it shut, and plasma will flow down to the distal tip of the device. You can see that it appears white for um, blood that has a normal bilirubin level, and this is blood from a baby with an elevated bilirubin level. You can see by eye that it's yellow. You simply insert this little um, uh, disposable into the reader that you see here, press the button, will shine um, light at three different wavelengths through that piece of paper and report the bilirubin concentration. So we just completed and published a pilot study looking at uh, a clinical assessment of this compared to a, a laboratory standard. And you can see here's the bland Altman plot. So we're within plus or minus two milligrams per deciliter for our agreement. We're very close to meeting the CLIA standard with this device. And if we compare that to the performance of a transcutaneous bilirubinometer, you can see this is not from the same population. This was a study done at Luth in, in um, Nigeria looking at the accuracy of a transcutaneous bilirubinometer. And you can see there, they're within minus two to plus almost five milligrams per deciliter. It's not accurate enough um, for that population. And if you look at what would happen to the $1.48 number, if we replace our bilirubinometer with this device, the $1.48 number goes over $12. And that increase is almost exclus exclusively associated with the consumables that are needed to calibrate the transcutaneous bilirubinometer. So it's sold under a razor, razor blade model, which just doesn't work in a setting where cost is such a big pressure. Similarly, delivering fluid to babies, IV medications or um, or saline or glucose solution has to be delivered at carefully controlled rates. And um, syringe pumps are a real challenge to keep going in this environment. So we have developed a very low cost syringe pump that has a, a streamlined user interface that is less likely to lead to user error. Because of the way the, the drivetrain is designed, it can run for 
over 70 hours on a single battery charge. So if the power goes out, as is common in these settings, it will keep delivering fluid. This meets IEC standards for performance for syringe pumps in the United States. And um, this is just looking at the accuracy. Um, we've, we've evaluated it both in newborns as well as in pregnant women who, are, uh, who have preeclampsia and are being treated with magnesium sulfate. And in both populations, it meets IEC standards for performance. And then finally, um, I think this is my favorite technology because one of the things that surprised me so much was the invisible what I think is a medical emergency of hypothermia. There are so many babies who are dying because they are too cold in this setting. Nurses have access to thermometers, but in a setting where there may be one nurse to every 20 babies, it's really difficult for them to have time to measure temperatures frequently enough and then they don't necessarily have access to warmers for babies that are not stable enough to be receiving kangaroo mother care. So we've designed a really simple wearable that displays the temperature. And so you can see this baby was at 35 degrees C. That's hypothermic, so there's a blue light on the top. They can easily see just by looking across the ward if a baby is too cold, just right, or has a fever and then intervene appropriately. We use the same sensor to um, control a warming crib if the baby does need to receive additional um, warming to, to, um, to get back to a normal temperature. And this device is completely reusable. We can make it for less than $25. Um, it's a really uh, simple technology. We've just completed a pilot study evaluating this technology, and it performed equivalently to the GE vital signs monitor. Um, so um, how do we keep things out of the equipment graveyard? All of these technologies are designed to be rugged, but they still need preventive maintenance, and they still need, in some cases, reparative maintenance. To address that challenge, we've partnered with local engineering schools. And one of the things that I think is an amazing opportunity is a lot of universities in Sub-Saharan Africa now are starting biomedical engineering diploma and degree programs. Um, and this is something that the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education in many locations are collaborating to do. Um, when you look at engineering education in this part of the world, it tends to be very theoretical, and students have very few opportunities to actually um, do design or to um, uh, interact hands-on with equipment in laboratories. And so one of the things that I'm most excited about is we've been able to partner with the University of Malawi and build an engineering design studio there. And so here you see students who are working in that engineering design studio. They are developing locally appropriate ways to repair oxygen concentrators and to develop um, spare parts that can be used to regenerate the compressors and to regenerate the sieve beds without having to import expensive replacements. And we're just getting ready to expand this to another school in Malawi and um, also the Dar es Salaam Institute of Technology. And I think that's really um, what can lead to the next generation of innovators that can uh, solve health problems in other parts of the hospital. We've been doing bi-directional student exchange now for the last three years with students from Malawi coming to Houston, students from Rice going to Malawi, and participating in uh, teams to, to take on these design challenges and doing the same thing at the faculty level. And we're really excited to begin to expand that. I'm out of my range, here we go. So I, I wanna talk about the challenge of distribution because this um, surprised our whole team when we really began to understand how big this challenge was and what it would take to solve it. So um, as the Pumani CPAP was developed, uh, we partnered with Third Stone Design, an industrial design firm. The very first generation of the Pumani that was evaluated clinically looked like the device you see there on the left. 
So it was in a more rugged enclosure than the device in the plastic shoe box, but it didn't look like the final product, which has gone through the, the CE mark process. And so these devices are now made in the Bay Area by a manufacturing group called Pride Industries. They're made at um, relatively low volume. So um, over a thousand CPAPs have been sold. They've been sold in 30 countries where they're, they're being used. And um, the, the CEO of Third Stone Design has opened up the financials of the company. So they licensed the technology from Rice and they licensed it at 0% royalty. Um, and they guaranteed that they would set their price um, within a certain fraction of their cost of making it and that they would prioritize filling orders in Gabi eligible countries. And so for us in licensing the technology, access was really the thing that we were um, most interested in ensuring. And so if we look at the cost to distribute a single Pumani device, it cost them about $550 to make it. They sell it for $800. And so that leaves you $250. But $250, it turns out, is not enough to distribute Pumani. You've got to ship it, you've got to clear customs, you've got to train users, and you've got to provide service. And all of those costs and their experience add up to $750. And so every time Third Stone ships a Pumani out of their facility, basically, they're sticking a $500 bill on top of it. So I'm not a business person, but I know that this is not a sustainable way um, to, to move forward. And that's where I think um, we get really excited about the opportunity to bring together a package of technologies. So just like a one technology newborn unit can't solve the problem of improving newborn survival, a one product company cannot be sustainable without elevating prices to the point that it are, are not affordable. So if you think about what happens when we're distributing a package of technologies, the cost of goods is higher. We estimate that it will cost $26,000 to equip that NICU that I showed you earlier. Um, so you've still got some margin left, um, but the cost of distribution are not 17 times what they are for one technology because you can package them together, you can train people to use them together, a service technician who's making a call for one uh, piece of equipment can look at the entire package. And so you gain enormous um, ability to sustain this in distributing a package of technologies together. And so our colleagues at Third Stone are now working to establish two distribution hubs in country. We're targeting uh, Nigeria and Tanzania as the initial locations for those distribution hubs. And our team is focused on targeting a network of seven countries in Africa that have partnered with the World Health Organization and UNICEF to form what's called the Quality Equity Dignity Network. These countries have committed to cutting newborn deaths in half within four years. And these seven countries together represent 46% of births on the continent. And so our hope is that in targeting these seven countries that account for almost half the births on the continent, we can get to a tipping point um, that will support their, um, their dissemination much more broadly throughout the continent. We've done projections for um, what we think it will take to make this distribution uh, organization uh, sustainable. And we think it will take philanthropic investment. So the little white bars here represent philanthropic investment, uh, sales revenues, and then costs. And we think within a six year period, it can get to sustainability. Um, and um, it's based on the actual data of distributing the, the Pumani CPAP. So um, one of the things that we're really excited about is the opportunity to begin to partner with social impact investors to think about how to target not just facilities that are public facilities, but to think about how to target private hospitals. In a country like Malawi, almost all of the healthcare is provided by either government hospitals or um, the, the faith-based mission hospitals. 
Um, and so although they're private, it's not the same as a place like Nigeria, for example, where more than half of care in the country is provided through private for-profit hospitals that are serving um, not just wealthy Nigerians, but a, a broad spectrum of, of uh, patients of different income levels. So um, one of the most exciting uh, things for us over the last two years is when we learned about an organization called the Medical Credit Fund. What the Medical Credit Fund does is it partners with private hospitals and it offers them loans. Uh, well, it doesn't offer them loans. It guarantees loans um, for them to invest in capital equipment to improve their services. So um, they have uh, provided over 1,500 1, loans. They work with local banks. So they have 14 local banking partners that they work with. So the banks provide the loans. The medical credit fund guarantees the loan. So they help hospitals that don't have a credit history or collateral get ready to go to the bank. They have dispersed over $30 million over the last five years. Any guesses as to what their default rate is? Would you believe 3%? It's amazing. Um, and we're really excited because the average loan size is about $20,000. So it's very comparable to what we project will be the cost of the NEST package. And so we're partnering with the Medical Credit Fund to use some of our resources to play around with the credit terms. Because it might be that if you were willing to target a 5% default rate, you might be able to make twice as many loans. Medical Credit Fund knows right now that they're turning away a lot of good credit risks, but their investors are not very risk tolerant. And so I think it's a really exciting opportunity to see how can technology developers partner with impact investors to help get their technologies to scale. So um, finally, I want to talk about the, the data that's needed to get um, uh, to aggregate demand on the, the public sector side. So here what we're doing is we're partnering with our colleagues at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and we're beginning to roll out NEST in Malawi. We've started with the eight technologies that are commercially available and in Malawi what we're doing is we're evaluating what are the things that are barriers to scale, what are the conditions that are necessary to get to scale and using that to develop a theory of change. We will then move to Tanzania, where we'll implement a step wedge trial in southern Tanzania, where the newborn mortality rate is over 40. And we'll look at what is the impact, what are the cost, and what is the cost effectiveness of rolling out this package of technologies to support comprehensive newborn care. And then we'll work in Nigeria to evaluate this market-based model of financing technologies for private sector facilities. We're working as part of the quality of care network. And I think this is really um, an amazing opportunity because these are countries that are committed to the same goal that we are, which is to reduce the deaths of newborns in hospital facilities. Twenty thirty is only twelve years away. We know that you can't get to twelve without having technology available. No country has been able to do that. And so if we're going to do it, people need these things yesterday if they're going to have a chance to make an impact. I think without access to technologies that make comprehensive newborn care available, we're stuck in the situation where it will be over 100 years before babies in Africa catch up to all of the benefits that babies who are born in high-income countries have, have benefited from. And over a million babies will continue to die really unnecessarily in Africa alone. So we think by making this package available, we have the potential to reduce by half death rates in the next decade and do it at a cost that has been acceptable for scaling up vaccines, which have had enormous impact on reducing childhood death. 
Um, I am I'm part of a much larger team that includes my colleagues in Malawi, my colleagues in Tanzania, in Nigeria, in Chicago, and in London. Um, and it's just been such a pleasure to work with this amazing group of people. Um, and I want to end with this picture, um, which is probably my favorite picture in the whole world. This is Chiken Jutso. And um, he's the little baby that you saw in the video at the beginning who was struggling to breathe. And this picture was taken, um, he was uh, just over two years old when this picture was taken. Um, his name means the conqueror. And our hope is to enable hundreds of thousands of babies like Chiken Jetso to conquer the challenges that they face right now in just surviving the first day of life, the first week of life, and to make many, many more photos like this possible. Let me stop there. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I think that we have some microphones on each side. If anybody has a question, please raise your hand. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks for sharing all that wonderful work. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more specifically about how these innovations have worked in practice, the development of the innovations have worked in practice. So what are the roles of students, faculty? Is this around classes? Or how, how have you put it in practice? Yeah, so um, what, we, what we do now um, is um, we do a lot of shadowing of clinicians, nurses, clinical officers, physicians, and really try and understand what are the barriers they face in delivering care. And then turn those into design challenges that um, we'll bring to teams of students. Um, sometimes they'll come up with something that looks promising. Other times, it's just a good learning opportunity for the students. Um, where they come up with a, a prototype that looks promising, um, we will work with students who are interested in continuing it as part of an independent study where that makes sense or we'll maybe move it up from a freshman to a capstone um, design team. We um, have really made use of post-baccalaureate fellowships to take things from a promising prototype to something that you can actually get into clinical evaluation. So these are typically students who are coming in recent, with a recent bachelor's degree or master's degree and who will spend usually two years really focusing on moving that forward. Um, sometimes we'll move some of the projects up uh, to where a PhD student is taking it forward. So the Billy Rubin work that I um, presented actually started with a sophomore design team, moved into a capstone design team, and then there was a PhD student that really took it across the finish line. Um, the um, syringe pump, was an example where it went through two senior design teams till we really sort of got it right. And then um, there was a post-baccalaureate fellow who's taken it to where it is now. And so you know, we've got this sort of continuum of, um, of students and staff who are engaged at various points along the way. Um, there's a very close communication between our clinical collaborators. So we do regular design reviews to make sure that you know, we don't fall in love with our technology and end up developing something that they don't really want. Um, like on the, the temperature monitor, what I told the students was, um, don't waste your money on a digital display. You know, I just want a blue light, a green light, and a red light. And what the nurses said was, whoa, we, ap we absolutely want that digital display because every four hours we have to record the temperature and it will save us so much time if you include that. And at first, like, I didn't believe the students, so I went and asked the nurses and it was definitely uh, where the feedback was coming from. So, you know, we try to really guard against biases like that. So another question. Um, did all the units have battery backup? So they don't, um, and uh, load shedding is a huge challenge in this environment. Um, the approach that we're taking is to look at providing solar backup power together with the suite of instruments because it's really difficult um, to power some of the devices with battery backup, like the oxygen concentrators, for example, and the radiant warmers are the two things that are the most power hungry. Um, we've tried wherever possible to include battery backup, so the syringe pump has it, 
The warming crib that we've developed was specially designed to retain heat, um, but we're, we're exploring solar backup as a way to power things like the concentrator and the radiant warmer. Yeah, I'm wondering if there are uh, counties or maybe cities in, in this country that would benefit from implementation of some of these devices. So I think, um, I think the answer is really device specific. So I think potentially the Billy Rubin device, for example, we've had pediatricians here express a lot of interest in having access to something like that. Um, we've had interest in the CPAP as a transport device. So for a baby that's getting transferred from a community setting to a higher level of care, um, right now they're providing support by hand. Um, and so this is something that um, could easily be used for transport. Um, you know, I think um, when we're designing them, we really think about what is the right set of features to meet the needs of, of our target hospitals. And we're, we're not so much taking the approach of, can we come up with something that can work in both types of settings? Um, so it's, it, when there are opportunities, we're really interested in exploring them. Thank you for the talk. Um, some of these technologies seem like they utilize uh, technologies that are not so exotic. And I'm wondering what the reason for current devices being so expensive are. What are the primary reasons that current devices are so expensive that are unaffordable while you can make one that is a fraction of the price? So, um, uh, you know, I think there's, there's two reasons for that difference. So um, one is we've really thought about what is the minimum set of features that is necessary in an environment where um, basically, um, when you look at viability for babies in this setting, babies who weigh less than 1,000 grams really don't survive in this setting. And that's very different than a NICU in the United States where you're taking care of 500 gram babies who are going to survive. And um, so I think because the population of babies that we're looking at um, are bigger um, in terms of weight, and they're usually further along in terms of gestational age, so you know, their, their weight is small for their gestational age. There are some features that would be necessary in a setting where you're taking care of really tiny, tiny babies that, you, that are not um, the first thing that you would want to put in in this setting, so that's one reason. Um, I think another reason is there's no question that one model of profitability for medical device manufacturing in this country is we're not going to make money on the hardware, but we're going to make a lot of money on the consumables. And that has been really challenging in this setting where distribution is such a problem. And so I can't tell you how many devices I have seen that get to the setting, they're used until the consumables that came with the device run out, and then it ends up in the equipment graveyard. Any other questions? Last one. Yeah, about the equipment graveyard, what are some common ways that the engineering students in Africa create their own spare parts for these machines? I'm not sure I understood your question. Was it what, what um, spare parts are they making for their own machines? Yes. What are they making to repair these devices? So with the oxygen concentrators in particular, um, it's, it was really interesting to, to look at what was happening. So I originally thought that they were failing because of line voltage surges, which were killing the, um, the electronics. And that turned out to be the case in maybe 15, 20% of the cases. But the much more common case was that um, dust in the environment was going through the case filter. So the case filter is just really inappropriate for dusty environments. Um, we did a little experiment where we took the case filters out, we swept up dust in the NICU, and we looked at what fraction of the dust was trapped by the filter, and it was less than 1%. Um, so not very effective. Um, 
That dust gets in the compressors, it causes the seals to fail. As the compressors start to fail, then um, the sieve beds start to fail. And so they're replacing the cup seals and the compressors, and then they're regenerating the sieve beds um, using some really innovative approaches. Okay, thank you. At this time, I'd like to, uh, Rebecca, give you um, a small token of our appreciation. Uh, you'll find a few um, Yale gifts in there. And a ceremonial envelope that uh, reminds you that uh, the honorarium, which is provided by the Silliman Endowment of $5,000, will be forthcoming as soon as you return from Africa. Uh, she is leaving, actually, tomorrow evening after she finishes her visit here with us uh, to head to Africa. Uh, in closing, uh, if I may, I'd like to thank a few people. Uh, first, Joe Howard, who is the chair of the Silliman Lecture Selection Committee and, and the remaining members of the committee. Uh, Mitzi Campbell from um, Biomedical Engineering, Steve Geringer and Bill Weir from the School of Engineering and Applied Science who did uh, most of the work in organizing this event. And I'd like to thank the student chapter of our Biomedical Engineering Society um, as well as our graduate students for participating and helping. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. And I would also like to invite you, if you will, uh, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., uh, as part of the tradition of the Silliman Lecture, it's really lectures. And tomorrow at 10 a.m., um, Professor Richard Cordon will give us a seminar in biomedical engineering that will address some of the more technical issues of her work. Uh, that will be held at uh, the Mann Engineering Center, which is at 10 Hill House, room 107. So thank you all very much, and Professor Richards Cordum, thank you for a wonderful lecture. <laughs>